Kid Eaters versus the Zoo Boys, Chapter 7, Part A. This is split into two parts because I didn't want it to be too long. Um, and Part B will be down below underneath, underneath the uh, written part of Part A on the blog. Major Hightower, the boys' tactical advisor, now felt less like a babysitter or just a chaperone and more like a team leader. Sure, the children were still lacking in some areas, but she had the confidence to provide the backing this crew needed. This, There was something about her that reminded John of a girl named Raven Stone. He saw that schoolmate in the hallways of his high school almost every day. He never spoke to her, and she hardly spoke to anyone. However, he was under the assumption that she was someone you'd want on your team if you needed to kill some monsters and stuff. Unlike the other girl, Christina Norman, who seemed to hang out with Raven the most. They slept there in the warehouse that night, practiced some things the next day. Then, before they knew it, it was time to load up and make their way to Zoo Island. Each boy had a backpack filled with a few survival tools, no guns or weapons, other than a Swiss army knife. They thought that was pretty cool. But they weren't so sure about the pepper spray. Sure, it might deter a bear, but you... Uh, deter a bear, but they didn't plan on getting close enough to any bear-like animal to see if it worked. They also had a blanket made of something like tinfoil. That was more valuable than they could know or even imagine. Anyway, their major had the cool stuff, weapons of mass destruction in her backpack, which was larger than they were. One entire boy could be put in there. Time was passing by too fast. It was time to board the aircraft and make their way toward the torture awaiting them and on the island. While on the helicopter, the boys marveled at the voices of those on the helicopter with them. The bulky headphones protected their ears from the overwhelming chopper blades, but also had a built-in speaker and a mic that wrapped around to the front of your mouth. The boys wore a small, child-friendly version while gaming, but this was the real deal. Each crew member seemed to have an accent all of their own. Hanson must have hired people from all over the world, although... Some of the crew weren't really speaking with accents at all. The onboard headset just distorted what was being said. As the radio squawk was given by the pilot to the boy, the boys hoped the air traffic controller understood what was said better than they did. The white noise mixed with static was casting through the air, giving them permission to be propelled what seemed like 10,000 miles high, into outer space. The boys' eyes weren't big enough to take it all in. They communicated with each other through nonverbal body language and, and, and looks they exchanged. Once in the air, they heard a loud beep, then confirmation from the main pilot. <coughs> that typical walkie-talkie sound of the CB radio was always at the beginning and the end of each sa of each statement. Uh, uh, check, check, on board private intercommunications is on. Permission to speak freely, boys. By boys, the pilot was referring to the flight crew members, not the minor male adolescents. Although crew members, uh, although another crew member was heard venting. Uh, yeah. You, you know, uh, some of you really got to give them some of them liquor. They couldn't understand them, but they strained to listen anyway. Uh, uh, 
uh, yeah. You know, some don't really give a shit if they uh, take off or land safe. The arseholes are professional hypocrites. <coughs> the pilot responded, <coughs> Easy there, Jonesy. The pay is all the same. The pay is all the same. <coughs> Yet another crew member chimed in, <coughs> I wasn't there. <coughs> John mistakenly thought the guy said, I won the dare. Ron didn't mean to speak next. He was pretty sure the communication was only allowed between the official adult flu crew members. His words came out anyway. Uh, I wonder. He said, I wonder there? No, I wasn't there. Yeah, I, 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 I wonder too. Uh... Uh, sir, uh, I'll stop talking now. The airmen exchanged looks and Ron sunk into his seat. The safety straps kept him from sliding off and onto the floor. The offensive looks the men threw around turned into smirks and smiles. There was something fresh and even amusing about delivering this type of venture to the boys. They were all accustomed to the way the radio scratched and jumbled their speech. For a newbie, the words all ran together. Even Major Hightower had to decode in her own mind what was being said. She, know she, she knew she may have to translate things that were said directly to the boys, but she also knew the crew on board this flight rarely addressed her, let alone any guest passengers. It was the old school seen and not heard mentality. She also knew the men still showed some resentment toward her simply because she was a woman in what was predominantly a man's world. The boys listened in. Along the way, as the men talked trash about their commanders uh, uh, and comrades, the overdose of testosterone was almost stronger than the He-Man act David's dad dished out. Ron, having already spoken once, was not about to say one word. Jeremy smirked, and when he was able to translate another man's word at first, it sounded like the guy said, It's whiskey. What he really said was, It's risky. The man stationed in the back of the helicopter said, How come there's so not, there's uh, still not mushroom in the back, Jimmer? You got too much tough. Over. The translation of there's not mushroom was there's not much room. And too much stuff was too much stuff. The man they called Jimmer responded, School, Mark. Let's fly without the extra gear. Try jumbling and jumping without lines and parachutes. <coughs> Over and out. <coughs> John wondered if his friends heard something about school with the way the phrase, it's cool, came out. The third man uh, backed up the retaliation with <coughs> twos of the trade. I pity the food, blames the twos. <coughs> Dave was proud, had a proud moment because he knew the wording was tools, not twos of the trade. He recalled how someone, uh, he recalled how some also said the word jail funny. When some people in jail, man, I'm sorry, when some people in jail, when some people said jail, it sounded like they were saying gel. In his head, he heard the word and accent of this kid named Joe Kilmer saying, I hate gel. It's hard in her. It cracked him up how the word here was pronounced her. The whole phrase untranslated sounded so perverted. Some accents were practically speech impediments. Well, the doctor's name was Michael Kane. When one of the crew members uh, 
use the full name in a sentence, it sounded like he said, ah, uh, well, I'm sure glad we got my cocaine on board. Ah. In Ronnie's mind, he wondered why they kept calling one guy Monkey. Later, he figured out that the man's name was Mike Key. This actually left Ron feeling let down. He looked forward to catching monkeys, so uh, monkeys that they only saw in the distance using the tree canopy like a highway far above their heads. On the last visit to Zoo Island, he wanted to capture and keep one. That ushered his thoughts through a dark valley, reminding him that he had to return Tina, the tiny tiger, the domestic cat he kept since their last trip. When the initial idea about catching animals was pre presented to the boys, they honestly thought it meant catching them on video. To the boys, shooting them meant capturing pictures, like a photo shoot. Quickly, they realized they were being sent to not just seek out the creatures, but succeed in catching them in cages. The boys knew this task was pretty much a deadly mission and they questioned was being dead better than serving their sentence in jail they also questioned do the adults involved realize how dangerous and downright deadly this mandate is john wanted so badly to take talk back to the superiors who were forcing them to tackle this feat he was compelled to shout capture one housefly is no big deal but many Horse flies, literally flies the actual size of horses, definitely requires someone with the skill of driving cattle or controlling a team of wild horses. The same goes for ants, the type on the island that picked me up and literally flew off with my body. Although that is what John wanted to protest, he remained silent. Like the good little boy, the correctional department pushed through the proverbial hamburger grinder. They all knew that speaking up, talking back, expressing yourself in any way only resulted in more punishment and penal system torture. They didn't want to believe the stories about corporal punishment that, may, that many claimed uh, the prison administered, and yet, at the same time, they wouldn't rule it out either. All four boys liked the whole good and evil superhero syndrome, but the line between what was right and wrong was not only blurred, it was a smear since the start of this project. They were no longer sure what was good, right, and honest. There was no longer just black and white or shades of gray. They were dealing with an array of colors far beyond the acronym of Roy G. Biv, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and typical of a typical rainbow. John, the artist among them, once said to his friends, if Zoo Island were a box of colors, it would uh, feature far more than just primary or typical secondary colors. He was still amazed how the three colors, red, yellow, and blue, formed secondary colors that were formed from just those three, almost a, an infinite amount of colors available. He likened it to his friends and how their personalities combined made such an amazing spectrum of colorful characters and language. Their story would not be the same if John, the fourth color, wasn't blended. The boys snapped back into the heaviness of the task at hand as the helicopter's blades blended the air above them and below them. They found themselves in flight holding pattern waiting to land. Now go on to chapter 7, part B.